short joke for you, but I, first I have to ask a question. Anybody know what an antenna is? Most of us still remember before cable and satellite dishes and remember we had those big things on our house that you moved around with a, if you were a poor folk like us, you had to go out and turn the pole. Yeah. Well, it seems that two antennas met on a roof and they fell in love and got married. I heard the wedding ceremony wasn't very much, but the reception was fabulous. <laughs> I told you it could get worse. <clears throat> okay, one more. A rough looking, dirty jumper cable walks into a bar. The bartender waves his finger at him and says, look, I'll serve you, but you better not start anything. <laughs> okay, that's the best I have. <laughs> Rick and Kelly both said something this morning that I, I, I just want to think about. When we talk about Thanksgiving, what do we really treasure in life? If there was a fire in your house and you had to get out, what would you grab? What would be your priority? See, Thanksgiving is to be a time when we express our gratitude for all that God has done. But if on Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, we get right back to being greedy and materialistic, then really what's the point? I guess the question is, is Thanksgiving just one day? I read something on the internet lately that was really sobering to me, maybe you. It said, what if we only had today the things we thank God for yesterday? Pretty sobering stuff, huh? In Luke chapter 12 and verses 13 to 21, Jesus told a parable about a man who was looking out for number one. His primary purpose was not just to survive, but to wind up with tons of stuff. That's what mattered most to him, more than others, more than even God. So Jesus took time to teach. I think he knew how difficult it was to keep things in proper perspective. That's why nearly half of all the parables recorded focus on our attitude towards possessions. Did anybody realize that? Half of all the parables recorded deal with our possessions and our attitude towards them. Listen as I read to you from Luke chapter 12 and verses 13 to 21. This is from God's word. Someone in the crowd said to him, Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable, this story. He said, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. <coughs> Excuse me. When I look at this passage, the first thing I see is a problem. Verse 13 says, someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide up the inheritance with me. Some request. Bible scholars think that this was probably the younger brother asking the question because he was bothered by the fact that according to the Levitical law, in family inheritance, the older brother got two thirds of the possessions where the younger brother got a third. So I'm sure that's the guy asking the question. 
Now, I'm sure we've all seen families fight over inheritances or questions and accusations leveled against business associates. So Jesus, he uses this question as an opportunity to teach. He knew that the problem, well, that the problem was much deeper than inheritance. This man's problem was not how he could get him to help receive a bigger inheritance, but it was how he could overcome selfishness and materialism. So Jesus answers the man in verses 14 and 15. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. I could stop there and that could be our lesson. Be on guard because of all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. You know, the phrase watch out there was actually a military term which meant to be on guard duty. So he's saying be on guard against all kinds of greed. Like you're standing there with a rifle, like you're holding a post. It's a military expression. And why be on guard? Well, he answers his own question. Because a man's life did not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus is teaching there's more to life than things. Do we get that, folks? I mean, we all would nod and say, yeah, I, I get that. But is that how we live? Do we live based on the belief that life is more than just things? And what about the word greed in this passage? If you do a study on the word that the Bible translates greed here, uh, it's pleonexia. And the word is an insatiable desire for more. He's defining greed as an insatiable desire for more. Anybody know anybody out there with an insatiable desire for more? Yeah, look, a bunch of us are shaking our heads. Friends, for reason that's greed or materialism is a problem. The first is greed makes us captive to the enemy. See, left on our own, we tend to covet things. We sometimes want what others have, and our greed quickly leads to envy. First Timothy chapter 6 and verses 9 and 10 says this. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many kind of griefs. Folks, maybe this Thanksgiving, we should use it to calibrate our lives. Maybe we ought to use this time to examine our material. Maybe we should ask ourselves, are we that person who's always wanting more? Because Jesus is enough, right? Not only does greed make us captive to the enemy, secondly, greed makes us captive to indebtedness. I've heard counselors say that financial tension causes more divorces than, more divorces than marital infidelity. Larry Burkett, a Christian financial expert who did a great deal of counseling with people in financial trouble before he died a few years ago, used to say that 95% of the couples he counseled are in financial trouble because of overspending. Now let me ask, how many of you think it's because of the wife's overspending? Come on, show of hands. Ah, uh, nobody is brave enough to raise their hand. How many of us believe it's because of the whole husband's overspending? Kelly's going on record for that, Shelly, yeah. The truth is 85% of the time it's because of the husband's overspending. How about that, guys? Burkett said that women tend to spend more often, but splurge on things like clothing and food and not big ticket items. But men tend to splurge on things like new cars and boats and elaborate toys. My wife Martha's in the back right now saying, motorcycles, <coughs> motorcycles. <coughs> yeah, that's us guys. Folks, spending and hoarding may be different 
maybe a different, a little bit of process, but both can be rooted in greed, this insatiable desire for more things. And isn't that why we buy on credit and why we refuse to get rid of the stuff that we have? The storage business is booming because people buy more than they need or could ever use and they're not willing to part with it so they pay to store it. <laughs> Anybody want to stop, start putting up storage sheds with me? Seems like a good money-making opportunity there. Third reason that Jesus warns against greed is that greed can lead to stealing. When our appetites become too big for our checkbooks and we can't control our desire for more, we become tempted to take what we can't buy. Police tell this story in Wheeling, Illinois. They accused a Walmart cashier of buying merchandise at the store using credit card numbers she copied from customers. They didn't have any trouble tracking her down or catching her, because it seems like that she identified herself on the fraudulent receipts to make sure she got her employee discount. Uh -huh. oh, bless. The last problem we see with greed is greed causes a loss of eternal perspective. And that's the greatest problem. There are serious consequences. Listen to the Apostle Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 3 to 5. He says, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. And then he goes on. Or any kind of impurity or of greed. Because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, false talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Is thanksgiving just one day, or is it every day? I think it answers that question, doesn't it? For, for this, you can be sure. Listen to this. No immoral, impure, or greedy person. Such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Ooh. Friends, what's the priority in your life? They ask a class of first graders, if there was a fire in your home and you could only get one possession, not people, just a possession, what would it be? And one six-year-old boy said, if I had to run in my house in a fire and get one thing, I'd get my Bible. Wow. And don't we want to all, all be more like that? Don't we wish our priorities communicated more of a passion for the eternal rather than the temporary? A hunger to hold on to something spiritual rather than something material. Well, I guess we all need to stop and ask the question, do I possess things or do things possess me? If God has blessed us with a nice car or a house or a boat, congratulations, that's great. But please don't put more emphasis on it than you should. I think we looked at the problem, certainly selfishness and greed and materialism. Let's now look at the parable of how Jesus teaches about right priorities. As Jesus tells the story, we look at it closely, we see selfishness more than accomplishment. In just three verses, Verses 17, 18, and 19, the personal pronoun occurs 10 times. Verse 17, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. The only time he says the word you is in the next phrase, and he's referring to himself. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. I think we have to see the man in this parable thought only of himself and nothing of eternity. He was in the process of establishing his personal empire. I don't know about you, but I've seen people like that. Nah, I'm sorry, I don't have time for church. I'm building a company. 
Now, I don't have as much time for the family, can't get to my kids' little league games. These first couple of years of the business are the toughest, and then we'll be set, and then we'll take care of that stuff. When I see them, I always want to ask, if you climb the ladder of success, and you get to the top, and your loved ones aren't there with you, have you really accomplished anything? I heard this illustration about a stockbroker who was granted one wish by the Lord. The man thought and he said, all I want is to see a newspaper one week prior to the date it's printed. He knew if he could view the stock market one week earlier and know what was gonna happen, he could invest heavily and become a millionaire in one week. So God granted him the wish. He received the paper and he studied the stocks and he planned his strategy and he worked so hard on it and it came to a conclusion so quickly that he had time to look through the rest of the paper. And when he came to the obituary column, there was his name. Folks, if that were you, would that change your strategy for life? Would you alter how you spent the next six, six days? Jesus said this, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his soul? In this account, Jesus says to the man with misplaced priorities, he says, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? We looked at the problem, we looked at the parable. Now let's close out today by taking a look at the solution. And as we do, I caution you not to misapply this story. It's not saying never build bigger or have ambition. We have a real tendency to make these applications that Jesus never intended, and that's very dangerous. That's why you must look at the entire parable for, con for the context. Jesus condemns selfishness as a sin here, not ambition. In fact, through Proverbs, the Bible, and through the rest of the Bible, ambition is applauded as long as it's in accordance to God's will and for the right reason. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 to 8 says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways to be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food in harvest. Jesus is saying complacency and selfishness are the enemy. Ambition and proper priorities are embraced. The guy in the parable, all he wanted to do was eat, drink, and be merry. He wanted to coast. He wasn't prepared for death. He just wanted to kick back and live the high life. And Jesus says in Luke 12, 21, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves. He didn't put a period there. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. I will close today with three simple solutions that we can find from this passage. Number one, I think we need to acknowledge that everything belongs to God, that it's his. God owns and we manage. Richard Foster writes in his book, The Challenge of the Disciplined Life, he said, God's ownership of everything changes the kind of question we ask and give it. Rather than how much of my money should I give God, we learn to ask, how much of God's money should I keep for myself? How much of God's money do I need to operate? Second thing I think we can learn from this passage is to practice generosity and be a model to others. Teach your kids and grandchildren stewardship principles early on. Encourage them to save, encourage them to give, encourage them to invest. And the way to teach generosity is how to model it. That's one thing when, when I think of dad, dad was generous. And all of his kids are generous because we learned it at home. I was at a preacher's meeting over the summer and one of the guys shared that when he was a kid, he received a dollar allowance. Imagine that, a dollar. Each week, but his parents always gave it to him in the form of 10 dimes. 
to get him starting to think of what he would give to God. See, one of those times was God's. Sounds like a pretty cool thing to do. Lesson three, live your life with eternity in mind. Please don't get caught up in trying to keep up with the Joneses. Live in moderation. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. The core of the problem with this rich man in the parable was that's all he was about. His plan was to establish a personal empire. His focus was accumulating more and more, and in the process, he neglected the most important matter. He simply neglected this little thing called eternity. Folks, life is too short. You could die tonight. Then what would happen with your things? Mother Teresa said this. She said, it takes more than 15 minutes to pack your belongings. you got too much stuff. Glad she never came to my house. Anybody have those garages if you can't park your cars in because of stuff? <laughs> yeah. Here's what Matthew 6, 19 to 21 says. It gives us some simple advice. It says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, but where thieves do not, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then verse 21 says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I can always tell that about people of where their treasure is, because it's in where they spend their time. When missionary David Livingston died, he spent his whole life ministering over in Africa. The natives who loved him so much took out his heart and buried it in Africa before they sent his body back to England to be buried. They felt that after all these years of sacrifice and service that his heart belonged there. Folks, where would your heart be buried? At the office? In the mall? Underneath the TV set? In the safety deposit box at the bank? Because Jesus said, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Where's your treasure? Because wherever it is, that's where your heart is. I think this Thanksgiving, rather than dwelling on what we can accumulate, why not just focus on the things in which God has blessed us? How many people like to play chess? Anybody? How many people are terrible chess players? Yeah, me too. I'm not much of a chess player, but I do understand the object of the game. The goal is to get the other person's king while protecting your own. Good chess players set up a strategy that enables them to get their hands on the king. I played chess with a friend one time. I was cruising along. I'm capturing a bunch of insignificant men. I'm accumulating a large stack of those little pieces. One game I had almost all of his pawns and he had only one of mine. I was feeling pretty secure right up until the time that I lost. You see, a lot of people play chess like that, you know. They try to capture as many pieces as possible, but that's not how the game is played. You can capture nearly every piece on your opponent's side of the board, but if he slips in and captures your king, the game is over. I need to share with you something I learned. Many people play life like I play chess. They get so focused on accumulating the things of this world, well, that they take the focus off the king. Listen to me, please. 
it doesn't matter how much you accumulate in this world. If you lose the king, you've lost it. This Thanksgiving, can we celebrate having the king? Can we celebrate what we have? Can we find a way to share it? Because I think in that, <clears throat> Thanksgiving becomes, well, not just a day. It becomes a lifestyle. And I'd be the first to wish you a happy, happy Thanksgiving. Let's pray.